कैन गो लाइव नाउ गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन वेलकम टू द फाइनल डे एंड फाइनल सेशन ऑफ रिफ्रेशर कोर्स इन मैथमेटिक्स जॉइंटली ऑर्गेनाइज बाई टी एल सी एंड डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ मैथमेटिक्स रामानुजन कॉलेज आर टूडे स्पीकर इज प्रोफेसर अरुण कुमार भीषम प्रोफेसर अरुण कुमार भीषम रिटायर्ड एट द एंड ऑफ जुलाई ट्वेंटी एटीन एज सीनियर प्रोफेसर इन द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ मैथमेटिकल साइंसेज फैकल्टी ऑफ साइंस एंड एग्रीकल्चर at the university of zululand currently professor bisham is serving as the research professor at faculty of natural sciences mango suthu university of technology south africa and school of mathematical sciences university of kuala zulu natal south africa he is also visiting research professor at gla university mathura india professor bisham obtained his phd in 1988 in applied mathematics from university of cape town he has given over 200 invited talks all over the globe and has published around 200 research papers he is currently rated c2 in by the nrf and has refereed articles for several prestigious international journals several students have completed their masters as well as doctoral degrees under his supervision He is also guiding many postdoctoral fellows. He has received several awards, including CSIR Doctoral Bursary in 1985, the University of Zululand Council and Senate Research Grant in 1992, Council of Travel Grant in 1995. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you. You can start with your session. Okay. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. uh okay can all of you see the screen yes sir okay um i'm going to try to go to full screen okay can you see that yes sir okay um uh, it is a great uh, honor and privilege for me uh, to have been invited um uh, 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 at this refresher course to deliver this lecture um uh, and today uh, i'm going to speak about uh, dynamical system analysis in cosmology well just before i start i just like to say that you know um it's it's a pity that uh, we we're not meeting face to face but because of this covid pandemic uh, i think a lot of conferences etc are taking place online Uh, and maybe that's one of the benefits uh, of of this pandemic in the sense that you know there are so many conferences workshops etc that are organized online and in most cases registration is very is free or uh, the cost is very low so i think that's one of the benefits uh, of uh, uh, the covid right uh, and uh, uh So today I want to talk about dynamical system analysis in cosmology, uh, and I've tried to make the talk sort of uh, uh, reasonably understandable to sort of um, uh, anyone in mathematics, especially the students. So I hope I have not simplified it too much. Right now, this is a plan of my talk. Uh, I will start with the introduction, uh, and then uh, to dynamical systems in general. uh then i will give a one dimension analysis in one dimension or one variable uh then move on to a two dimension analysis uh that is a plane analysis uh of course the, one can also go higher uh, three dimensions which one can also visualize and draw but um i i won't go that far today uh then the next thing is to classify linear systems uh and then to look at nonlinear systems which are more the systems of interest uh, in in science in general and then uh, look at some applications to cosmology in which um i have done some research work with a, a postdoc of mine and then finally a uh, conclusion and some references right now dynamical systems are used to study physical systems that evolve in time 
Now, it's not only physical systems that dynamical system analysis can be applied, but it can also be applied to a number of different areas, uh, financial mathematics, biological modeling, uh, et cetera. So it has very wide applications. Right, so what we do is we assume that we have some system which is evolving in time and that the state of the system at any particular time can be described by means of a vector X, which is an element of a larger space. And this could be finite or infinite, although we'll just be looking at finite applications in this talk. Then we assuming that the evolution of the system can be written in the form, uh, the derivative of this uh, vector X with respect to time, change in time, can be written as an autonomous system. That is, it can be written as functions of X, um, where F, of course, is a function from your space X to X. Now, uh, what is the origin of dynamical systems? It actually started with Poincaré way back in the 19th century, who used topology and geometry to study the properties of all solutions, which he looked at as trajectories or paths, uh, curves in state space. Uh, we'll explain um, these things more as we go along. And then the sort of formal development of the subject only started in the 1920s with the work of Birkhoff and other mathematicians uh, who started using the concepts of flow, omega set, et cetera, fixed points, equilibrium points, and so forth. Now, the kind of picture that um, emerges when you apply dynamical system analysis to various fields is something like this. This is a, a picture of um, uh, uh, evolution in cosmology, which we'll discuss more in detail a little later on, but I just thought I will flash this picture up at this stage, just to give you an idea of the kind of thing that we are looking for. Right, now, as we know, differential equations arise in many branches of mathematics and applied mathematics, uh, and these equations need to be solved. Uh, they also arise in many other fields as well, um, modeling, um, modeling of uh, COVID pandemic, so far. However, most differential equations cannot be solved exactly. Excuse me, if you take a very simple example, like uh, dy dt is equal to y squared plus t squared, then this all equation, although it looks very simple, but it does not have an exact solution. So what happens if you're investigating a problem and then you find that such an equation arises? Well, there are two approaches that can be used to try and solve the problem. Uh, one is to try and find a numerical solution, that is a quantitative solution. And these days, because of the use of computers, this is becoming more and more uh, applicable uh, because there are so many different uh, uh, so software uh, packages that are available to uh, find numerical solutions. Uh, for example, Mathematica and so forth. But then the other approach, which is more qualitative in nature, is to find out the important properties of the solution without actually finding the exact solutions themselves. In other words, how will the solutions change with time? How will they evolve? What do they look like in future? These kinds of questions. And in dynamical systems, we are interested mainly in the qualitative behavior of the system and not the quantitative properties. So let us start off with the simplest type of system that we can come across, and that is a one-dimensional system. So here is a, a nonlinear differential equation. Uh, x dot is equal to sine x. Um, again, it looks very simple. So we'll try and analyze this. 
And of course, in this case here, it's actually also possible to find the exact solutions, but we are not interested in that. We want to see how we can apply dynamical system analysis to get an idea of how the solutions behave without actually solving the differential equation. Right, now the dot uh, denotes a derivative with respect to time. Uh, and as I said, we can get a lot of information about the system from a dynamical system analysis. Now, what we do when we want to do this with a one-dimensional system is we draw the graph of equation three, which looks like this figure two. Now, uh, one can think of X as an imaginary particle which is moving along the x-axis. And uh, x dot, the derivative of x, is the velocity of the particle. Then what the differential equation three represents is a vector field on the line, which gives the velocity x dot at each point x. And then what we do, we draw arrows at these points to indicate the direction in which the particle is moving. And um, when x dot is greater than zero, then the arrow will point towards the right. And when x dot is less than zero, it would point towards the left. So there's a graph of uh, x dot. So we can see in this area, for example, uh, x dot is positive, which means that your arrows in this segment here will all point towards the right. Uh, the imaginary particle is moving towards the right. Then this part here, from pi to 2 pi, uh, your x dot is negative, which means that your imaginary particle will be moving towards the left, and so forth. The pattern keeps repeating itself. So one can think of a fluid flowing along the x-axis with a velocity that changes according to this rule here, x dot is equal to sine x. And as we mentioned already, the flow is towards the right when your x dot is greater than zero, and the flow is towards the left when x dot is less than zero. Now, what happens at these points here where your x dot is actually zero? Well, at those points, there is actually no flow. Those are called fixed points or equilibrium points. And they are of two kinds. If we look at this diagram here, what we notice is that at this point, for example, your fluid is flowing towards that point from both directions. If you look at this point here, for example, then from this point, the fluid flow is actually outwards. So uh, we give them a name, these solid points, where the fluid is flowing towards those points, we call them stable. Stable fixed points or attractor points or attractors or sink. Now, we are using the word stable in this context here where the fluid flow is actually towards the point. Uh, there are some other uh, definitions of stability that are used in mathematics, but uh, this is the context in which we will use uh, this uh, term stability. And then the open dots are the ones from which fluid is flowing outwards. And these points are called unstable fixed points, repellers and or sources. Again, the word unstable simply means that your flow is away from that point and not towards that point. Right, now from this diagram here, we can actually get a lot of information about the solutions to the differential equation without actually solving the differential equation. So let's say we start off with a particle which has a, a, a value of say pi over four. So in other words, it's starting off somewhere here, closer to the origin than to that point. So it starts off somewhere there. Now, uh, at that point, we want to see from that initial condition, that is x naught is pi over four, we use a naught to denote the initial condition. We can study how it moves. Now, what we notice from this diagram here 
is that from this point, that is uh, x is pi over four, the starting point, up to this point here, which is pi over two, x dot is actually increasing, right? X dot is increasing. So uh, what it means is that uh, from that point until it reaches x equals pi over two, it is accelerating. Now, after that, from x equals pi over two down to x is equal to pi, your x dot is decreasing, which means that the particle is decelerating. Right, and then eventually it approaches the fixed point x equals pi from the left. Now we can illustrate that, we can illustrate the solution qualitatively in this diagram here. So in this diagram here, t is the x-axis and this uh, uh, x is on this uh, y-axis here, right? And then this axis is time, the horizontal is time and the vertical is x. So the particle starts now from pi over four, right? And then we mentioned that it accelerates up to about pi over two. So from this point here up to this point here, the graph is concave upwards, this shape here, which means that it's accelerating. Then from this point up to pi thereafter, it decelerates, which means it is concave downwards, the shape here. And then it asymptotically approaches the point pi, right? So we see that we can get a lot of information about what the solution looks like without actually solving the differential equation. And we can now do that with a particle which starts off anywhere starts off here, here, or anywhere on this axis. We can study how it moves, just as how we studied uh, how this one moves. And we can draw the picture of the trajectories or the solutions uh, by making use of these rules here. That is, if your x dot is greater than zero, the particle moves to the right, asymptotically approaches the nearest signal point, if x dot is less than zero, then the particle moves uh, towards the left, approaching the nearest stable point to the left. If x dot is zero, then you've got the fixed point, x is constant, it doesn't move, it just stays there. And then we see again from uh, this diagram here that from zero to pi over two, the particle is accelerating from pi over two to pi, it is decelerating and so forth. So decelerating up to here, then accelerating and so forth. So uh, if the initial condition is between pi over two and pi, then the graph is always concave downwards because your x dot is always decreasing. So if it starts off from somewhere here to here, we can see that first of all, it has to move in this direction. And secondly, we see that because the x dot is decreasing, it will, the graph will be concave downwards. Right? And then if the initial condition, again, one can do this analysis now for any interval, one can now move on to this interval, again, from here to here, it's always decreasing and so forth. So, we see that if the initial condition is between pi and three pi over two, then the graph is always concave upwards as x dot is increasing. So between here and here, uh, sorry, between here and here, between here and here, your x dot is increasing uh, and so forth. So we get this picture here. Uh, so that's again your time along the horizontal axis and your x on the vertical axis. So this was the one that we had initially. Then as we mentioned, if the particle starts off from pi over two up to pi, then it's on, always concave downwards. It's decelerating and asymptotically approaches pi. If it starts off from a point between pi and three pi over two, then it is concave upwards uh, always. And then finally, if it's between 
uh, 3 pi over 2 and 2 pi, then initially it's concave downwards, decelerating and then uh, uh, accelerating, and then again asymptotically approaches the uh, line x, the line pi. So we see here that uh, uh, using our dynamical system analysis, we've got an idea of all the solutions and how they behave. And now one can apply this uh, analysis to any, uh, 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 to any uh, function f of x. If x dot is f of x, we apply the same procedure again. Here's some arbitrary function f of x, uh, and here are the fixed points. So again, uh, we draw the vector field on the x-axis. If uh, your x dot, which is f of x, is greater than zero, that's that area and this area here, then the particle moves towards the right. And if your x dot is less than zero, which is this area here, then your particle moves towards the left all along this area here. Right. Now, this imaginary fluid, it's not a real fluid, it's just an imaginary fluid flowing along the x-axis, is called the phase fluid. And in this case, because we're only dealing with a one-dimensional system, the x-axis is called our phase space, right? Uh, to find the solution, what, starting with any arbitrary initial condition, you place an imaginary particle at that point and then see how it moves with the flow, right? And the point will move along the x-axis with time according to the function x of t, right? So these solutions here, that these curves here that we have sketched are the trajectories or the solutions, the actual solution to the differential equation. Uh, and as I said, we also called it a trajectory uh, based at x naught. In other words, it's a solution to the differential equation with the initial condition x naught. And a picture or a figure showing all the qualitatively different trajectories is called a phase portrait. So uh, this figure here would be called a, called a phase portrait, right? Or uh, in fact, in this case here, we can also, uh, okay, I haven't drawn the alternative one in one dimension, but we'll come to an example just now. Right, so uh, the phase portrait is essentially controlled by the fixed points. We've seen that these fixed points where the function is zero, they are a very important part. They are called the steady equilibrium or stagnation uh, rest points. And if your initial condition is one of these fixed points themselves, then the value of the function x of t will remain that value for all time, right? It will not change because there's no flow at that point. So uh, in this figure here, the solid black dot denotes uh, a, a fixed point, a stable fixed point. The flow is towards that point. And this uh, open dot denotes an unstable fixed point because the flow is away from uh, that point. Right, so a few definitions. And here I'm just giving a few elementary definitions. Uh, one can make this uh, very mathematical and give more complicated definitions, but I'm just trying to make it simple so that it's understandable. A fixed point is called stable if solutions that start near it stay near it. A fixed point is called asymptotically stable if solutions that start near it approach the fixed point as t tends to infinity. So the difference here is that uh, in this case, the solutions need not necessarily uh, asymptotically approach the fixed point, but here they have to approach the fixed point as t goes to infinity. So at late times, they should approach the fixed point. And then finally, a fixed point is all unstable if solutions that start near it end up moving away from it. 
Right. So in our example, if we look at, um, let's go back to our diagram here. If we look at these points here, this point, oops, sorry. Uh, if we look at this point here, this point, the solid black ones, that is pi, uh, three pi, et cetera, minus pi, minus three pi, those are all stable points, right? And then these points here, zero, two pi, minus two pi, et cetera, those points are all unstable fixed points. Right, and these fixed points, uh, the, the fixed points, the stable points, also turn out to be asymptotically stable because as you can see from this diagram here, when you get a solution which is going towards one of these points here, they asymptotically approach that point. So they get closer and closer to that point as uh, time evolves. So those are also asymptotically stable as well. Right, now let's come to the next uh, uh, dimensional analysis, which is a more interesting one, has more applications. And this is the two-dimensional analysis. So here we'll first of all consider a linear system, and then a little later on, we will look at a non-linear system. Now a two-dimensional linear system is of the form x dot is ax plus by, and y dot is cx plus dy. These are derivatives with respect to time. And a, b, c, d are parameters. Right, now one can write this uh, in matrix form as x dot is equal to ax, where a is the matrix a, b, c, d, and x is the vector, the column vector x, y. And so the solutions of this equation here are the trajectories which move in the x, y plane. And in this case, the x, y plane is called the phase plane. Right, now let's look at an example which will illustrate many of the ideas for a two-dimensional linear system uh, and show us the different types of fixed points that can arise here. So let's look at this system here where A is the matrix A0, 0, 0, minus one, where A is some uh, real number, right? Between minus infinity to infinity. And what we want to do is we want to draw the phase portrait for this for different values of A as A changes from minus infinity to infinity, which shows the qualitative differences between the solutions. Right, now in this case here, this is a fairly simple system, but it will illustrate all the ideas. And it's actually possible to solve the system. But as I said, we will not look at the general solution, the exact solution, but we'll just look at the phase plane analysis, qualitative analysis. So you can write this as x dot is ax and y dot is minus y. One also notices that the system is decoupled. That is, this equation doesn't contain anything in y everything in X, and this one here doesn't contain anything in X, everything is in Y. Right, so you can actually solve these two separately, it's not very difficult. But as I said, we are more interested in the phase plane of qualitative analysis. And the phase portrait can be drawn without knowing the actual solution. Right, now the phase portraits here for this example depend on the value of A, and what we will do is we look at the different categories that can arise depending on the value of A. So here there's about five or six different types of solutions that can arise. Now, uh, apart from the kind of way that we were drawing these diagrams, these days there's a lot of software that is available to draw these uh, diagrams. In fact, one of the most simplest uh, and one that I've used yet on a couple of uh, occasions, some diagrams you'll see just now, is called P-plane. So if you just do a search for this uh, software P-plane, uh, you will be able to download it free of charge. Uh, you can download it, uh, save it somewhere, and then when you double click it, it just opens out. There'll be a few windows that open up, but all you have to do basically is simply type in your differential equation, uh, 
in the form of X dot and Y dot. And then you simply have to select the range on the axis and click on a button and it immediately draws the uh, vector field for you. And then if you just click on your diagram, it will draw your trajectories. So um, uh, here I'm just giving a few sketches of the different types of uh, solutions that can arise, the different types of fixed, fixed points. The first one is when A is less than minus one. And that is what is called a stable node. So what you find here in this case is there are these two trajectories, straight lines, which come from this direction and this direction and join the fixed point. And then you've got all these other uh, curves coming in from these two directions uh, and, and join this point. Of course, uh, as you can guess, you can also get uh, an unstable node where all the arrows point away from the fixed point. So this is a stable node. Then if you take A equal to minus one, uh, first of all, just notice that this is a special value of A. So there seems to be something special about this. And we'll see later that uh, uh, there is something special about these types of uh, 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 fixed points. This is called a star or a symmetrical node or a star. The difference between this and this is that here all your trajectories are coming in at straight lines. They're all straight lines coming in to that fixed point. So that is a node or a star. Then uh, just to show you how you can generate these diagrams, here is a picture that I got from that program P-plane <coughs> that I mentioned. Uh, when you use this program, you simply have to type in here your differential equation, that is uh, minus two X, and minus y, they will be sort of blocks there where you just enter them in. And then you click, there's a, a little window saying graph face plane. When you click on that, you get this diagram here, but it'll just give you the vector field. In other words, it will give you the green arrows. But then if you click on particular points on the, on the uh, graph itself, then it will generate these trajectories or uh, solutions for you. So you can see this is an example of this case here of, of the node. And it also shows you the directions here. So this is a stable node. Right, uh, then what are the other uh, 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 diagrams that you can get? Uh, here is another node when A is between minus one and zero. Right, but then again, if you look at A equal to zero, Again, this is a fixed, maybe it's a special point, some special properties, which we'll come to later. And this here is actually just a line of fixed points on the x-axis. In other words, the whole of the x-axis is uh, fixed points. And the trajectories simply are lines parallel to the y-axis. So it's a line of fixed points. And then finally, when A is greater than zero, this is the last category of solutions or trajectories that you can get. Uh, you get here what is called a saddle point. Now, the properties of the saddle point are the following. You will get trajectories here. Uh, there's one there, there's one there which is coming into the point. Then there's one there and one there which is going away from the point. So that's why it's unstable. And then you get these uh, trajectories here uh, in these directions here. Now, you can see that um, for this type of diagram, you, al although you have these two, uh, these two uh, trajectories which come to the point, but then the others move away from the point. So that is the reason why it's called unstable. For it to be stable, all trajectories must go to the point. So, so this is an example of a cell. Right, now, uh, fortunately, in the case of a two-dimensional system, uh, it is possible to get a classification of uh, uh, the system. Uh, and um, we studied a very simple example where two of the entries were zero. 
Now, what happens if you have a more complicated example? So we now study a general two by two matrix and classify all the phase portraits that can arise. So let's take A in general now to be A, B, C, D. From this matrix, you can derive the characteristic equation as the determinant of this matrix here, A minus lambda, D minus lambda equal to zero. And if you expand this determinant, you end up with this quadratic. And what we will do is we will denote tau to be the trace of A, that is A plus D, and delta to be the determinant of A, that is your AD minus DC. Now, one can actually classify all your fixed points according to uh, this uh, characteristic equation. So the roots of that equation are, uh, the roots of the quadratic are lambda one and lambda two, uh, tau plus that over two and tau minus that over two. And these roots, uh, your, essentially your lambda and your delta determine your uh, fixed points. So first of all, if these roots, okay, the roots can be real. And because you've got a square root of a quantity here, it's also possible that you could get complex uh, roots. So if the roots are real and opposite, then you have a saddle point. If the roots are real and positive, then you have an unstable node. If the roots are real and negative, then you have a stable node. Now, if you have the roots being complex, now it turns out that when you have complex roots, the roots uh, are, are complex conjugate to each other. If the real parts are negative, if your real parts are negative, that's your real part, then it's a stable spiral. Uh, if your real parts are positive, that is those two are positive, then you have an unstable spiral. Uh, okay, we haven't mentioned what spirals are yet at centers. We'll come to them shortly. Uh, uh, and, and we look at an example also which illustrates this. But um, uh, you will see just now that these three here actually are in a certain sense special uh, or what they call marginal uh, fixed points. And finally, if it's pure imaginary, then in other words, if your tau is zero, right, then they become pure imaginary. Uh, and this is negative, of course. Then you have what is called a neutrally stable center. Okay, don't worry about this term neutrally. It's used in a certain sense where you're looking at the up and of stability, but we won't be going uh, into that much detail. Uh, just think of it as a stable center. And then finally, the last case is where you can get equal rules. And those are, are what are called degenerate cases. So we'll be looking at this uh, in more detail, especially this a bit later on when we come to nonlinear systems. Right, now fortunately, all this can be illustrated on a diagram. See, this is a quadratic. So you can draw all of this in the tau delta plane, right? The tau delta plane, uh, just to refresh you, tau is a trace of the matrix A, that's A plus D, and delta is a determinant of A, which is A, D minus D, C. So in this diagram here, this quadratic, is tau squared minus four delta. In other words, the thing which appears under the square root. Uh, so on this side, where your delta is negative, you have saddle points. Uh, here in this region, you have unstable nodes. In this region here, you have stable nodes. Then here, you have unstable spirals in this region here. In this region here, you have stable spirals. And this line here, that is when tau is zero, you have centers. And then finally, on tau squared minus four lambda equals zero, this quadratic, you have stars or degenerate nodes, right? So these uh, the centers, uh, and, and of course, there's one more here, which is this line here which is non-isolated fixed points. 
Now, if you remember, when we looked at that example uh, earlier on, we had one example where the entire x-axis turned out to be the fixed points. And that is an example of this case here where your delta was zero for that example. Right, so this can be illustrated very nicely uh, in this diagram here, uh, just in terms of tau and delta or the roots. Right, now let's move on to the more interesting case and the one which arises more in practice, that is nonlinear systems. Because most systems, I think, turn out to be nonlinear. Very few systems are perfectly linear. Uh, the general form, again, is x dot is some function of x and y, and y dot is some function of x and y, some other function g of x and y, where these functions can be nonlinear. Now, again, in practice, when you're studying nonlinear systems, uh, it's difficult to find analytical exact solutions, or even when you find the solutions, they sometimes turn out to be so complicated, like in terms of special functions and so forth, that they're not easy to interpret. And you can't get an idea of how the solutions as a whole behave. So in that case, we resort to phase plane analysis. And we, how do we analyze this nonlinear systems? Well, what we do is, if we, we can easily find the fixed point simply by equating these to zero, and once you get the fixed points, what you can do is study the behavior near the fixed point of the corresponding linear system, right? Now, one can do this providing that the fixed point is not borderline. Now, remember we mentioned those borderline cases, that's uh, this parabola centers and your non-isolated fixed points. So providing you're not dealing with one of those cases, then it's possible to actually, the behavior of the nonlinear system near the fixed point actually turns out to be this, almost the same as the corresponding linear system. So what we do is we call this linearization. You linearize about a fixed point. So how would you go about doing this in practice? Well, again, what we'll do is we'll study this by means of an example. So let's take this, this is a, again, a very simple example. Uh, it's a pendulum. So you have a mass, which is suspended at the end of a string of length L, and the uh, mass is set in motion. You pull it to one side and release it, it will start oscillating. Um, this is a typical problem that even you study at, at high school, but in that case, you study the angle. We've used X here for the angle. Sometimes one uses theta, uh, but one usually takes this angle theta to be small, and in that case, uh, you can uh, approximate this to the linear equation where sine x is approximated to x, and then that's fairly easy to solve and it becomes a linear system. Uh, however, we know in practice that that is only an approximation or an idealization, because even if you start such a system uh, in motion, then what happens is Gradually, it's going to get less and less. There's some damping effects and so forth taking place. So in actual practice, the system is nonlinear. Right. Now, quite often, and this happens in many examples that you want to study using phase plane analysis, usually the system that you have is, does not lend itself easily to writing it in this form here. So in order to be able to write it in that form, what you have to do sometimes is to make a transformation uh, to bring it into a more suitable form. So in this case here also, uh, you see also that you only have one equation. So if you want to analyze it by phase plane analysis, you have to split this up into two equations. So to do that, what we do is we make a transformation. Omega is equal to frequency is equal to the square root of g over L. And we introduce a new time. We make a transformation of time by taking your original time and multiplying it by this frequency, omega. Then the system becomes this nice simple system here. That is your x dot is equal to y. And your y dot turns out to be minus sine x. Of course, now the dot would be a derivative with respect to tau. Right. And 
from here, it's very easy to find the fixed points. The fixed points turn out to be, this one is just zero and Y is zero. And for this to be zero, your X has to be a multiple of pi. So your fixed points are K pi zero, where K is an integer. Right, and the Jacobian, what you have to look at now is the Jacobian of the transformation. Now, if you have a transformation like this, where x dot is f of x, y, and y dot is g of x, y, then the Jacobian is given by this matrix here, that is partial d f d x and partial d f d y, partial d g d x and partial d g d y. So if we work this out for this example here, you will get 0, 1, minus cos x, 0. Right. And uh, you see here, you've got a cos x. So uh, you're going to have multiples of x, uh, of the angle x. So what you can do is there's going to be no difference between the angles that differ by 2 pi. So what we do is, uh, first of all, we will have one point when this is 1, right? Or when x is 0. Uh, so that's your first point, that is 0, 0. And then, uh, the other points will be multiples of pi. So as I said, we just need to look at one of those points. So we just look at the point pi is zero, right? Now, using the techniques that we described earlier, uh, you know, you go back to look at your roots and your, your tau and your delta and so forth, a characteristic equation, it's easy to show that the point zero, zero is a center. Right. Now let's consider the other fixed point that is pi zero. In this case, the Jacobian is zero, one, one, zero. And the characteristic equation for this is lambda squared minus one, right? Uh, whose roots are minus one and one. And again, uh, it's easy to show that these are saddle points, right? Then the eigenvectors corresponding to these saddle points turn out to be 1 minus 1 and 1, 1, right? So with all this information, we can now sketch the portraits near the fixed points. Remember, we've got, well, we've got two here, but there's going to be a multiple of points corresponding to multiples of 2 pi. But it's sufficient just to look at one or two of them. Right. Now, here is uh, what we have achieved so far. We said this point is a center, so you've got... Uh, these uh, trajectories which go around because it's a center. Then you've got these saddle points here, right? And well, let's just look at this one specifically. The directions of these arrows can be obtained from these eigenvectors. They tell you the directions. So you get this picture here. Remember we said that two of them have to be out and two of them have to be going in, right? So having obtained this picture here, which is just the picture near the fixed point. And we said that the behavior of the nonlinear system near these fixed points will be the same as the behavior of the linear system. But now what about the rest of this picture here? How do we complete this picture? And what will the trajectories look like? For example, we've got this one going out there, this one coming in there. What will happen to this? Where is this coming from? Where will this go? Well, there's several different ways in which one can try and complete this picture. There are certain mathematical techniques one can use. Uh, and also one can use intuition, knowing what the, the, the uh, center looks like, what the saddle points look like. Remember we had the saddle point before where you had these trajectories here uh, and so forth. So, and then of course the easiest way especially now with the development of good software programs, is you can simply put this into a computer program like the one we did before, like P-plane, and generate this diagram here, right? So this is a complete phase portrait. Uh, we don't have to analyze anymore because this picture will just carry on repeating itself in that direction and in this direction here, right? And again, here is a diagram using uh, the software P-plane, uh, P-plane, uh, where, as I said, you just plug in your uh, differential equations and choose your axes. 
diagrams and then just click on a button and it, it will it will draw these these diagrams for you and in fact uh, it will also tell you uh, in most cases what are the fixed points here uh, if you just click on a particular point it will tell you whether it's a center saddle point or no so this is a complete picture here of that nonlinear system now uh, one other point that we mentioned, uh, which we haven't discussed is a spiral, right? We haven't discussed what is meant by spiral. So let's now look at another nonlinear example, which gives rise to a spiral, right? Now let's consider this system here. X dot is this function of X and Y, and Y dot is that function. What we do is we linearize to get the Jacobian. Now, it turns out that in this particular example here, to linearize, because you see these are the nonlinear parts of this differential equation. For this particular example, it's also sufficient just to look at the, uh, the linear part in order to obtain your, 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 your Jacobian. Uh, or one can also justify it mathematically, but, but, but uh, some, the simplest way is just to do that. Or you can linearize and then just take the linear part, right? So you get this Jacobian, 0, minus 1, 1, 0. And if you work out your, from the characteristic equation, if you work out your tau and delta, you will find that you get tau is 0. So when tau is 0, we know immediately we're on that line, your tau uh, axis, which is, uh, which is uh, a center, right? So the point. Uh, 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 oh, of course, well, the first thing that one should do is simply solve, put x dot equal to zero, y dot equal to zero, and solve for your fixed points. Uh, and then uh, you will easily see that zero, zero is a fixed point. Right, which turns out to be a center. Now, okay, that's fine for that particular point and around that point, but then what about a general analysis around that point? Well, in order to analyze the system here, one has to make a transformation. And uh, sometimes it's not so easy to see what the transformation is going to be. Sometimes one has to play around before one gets the, the, the correct form. Uh, in cosmology, there are certain sort of um, uh, uh, transformations that people have found, which turned out to be very useful. Uh, which enable you to, to, to make progress. So in this case here, because you're dealing with a center circle, the obvious thing to do is to transform to polar coordinates. And if you transform to polar coordinates r theta, you will end up with this system here. That is your r dot is a r cubed and theta dot is one, right? So as you can see, the motion depends on the parameter a. Okay, and if you, if you uh, work out the different uh, fixed points which you can get for different values of A, remember we said that uh, the center is one of those marginal points. So one has to analyze it a little more carefully. And as it turns out, uh, this, you see the point about a center is that a very small perturbation away from that will move it to some other point, right? It will quickly go away from a center. So in that sense, it's like unstable. So it turns out that the motion actually depends on this parameter A, in the differential equations. And if A is less than zero, as you can see here, you see this is only a specific, the center is only a specific fixed point when A is equal to uh, zero, right? That's when you get your center perfect center. But the moment your A is less than zero or your A is greater than zero, then you start changing the nature of the fixed point. And here it becomes a stable spiral going towards the point. And here it becomes an unstable spiral going away from the point. So here's an example of a spiral. In other words, your trajectories start going closer and closer to the fixed point, asymptotically approaching the fixed point. And here, sort of asymptotically moving away from the fixed point. 
Right, so this is one example where you get both uh, spirals as well as centers which arise. Right, so having studied uh, dynamical systems in general, both the linear and nonlinear, we can now try to apply it to cosmology. Now, cosmology is the large scale structure and evolution of the universe. In order to study cosmology properly, you need a knowledge of general relativity. Uh, and Einstein came up with the field equations of general relativity way back in 1915. And these are the equations here. Now these things here, all these things turn out to be tensors, but uh, don't worry too much about the uh, details of this. Just think of them as matrices for the time being. Um, like RAB is your Ricci tensor, R is a scalar, GAB is your metric tensor. Uh, lambda here, very important quantity, is the cosmological constant. And then this here is your energy momentum tensor, TAB. Uh, roughly speaking, the left-hand side corresponds to geometry and the right-hand side corresponds to matter. So uh, I think it was John Wheeler who came up with this uh, uh, saying that uh, your space tells matter how to move and matter tells space how to curve, you know, going and working this way and working the other way. Right, now this, uh, the indices run from zero to three. Um, one is time and the other three indices are your spatial indices. Space time, you have to look at it in context of space time, normal space and time differently, but one four dimensional uh, manifold. And uh, although each of these indices can vary over four, uh, but it turns out, so, so in general, you will have 16 equations here, but it turns out because of various symmetries, because the system is symmetrical, uh, the, the uh, number of independent equations is 10. So at most you have a set of 10 partial differential equations. As you can imagine, it's difficult to solve. So how do you solve or study them? Well, the first thing that you can do always with the system is try to find exact solutions. And there are several exact solutions that are known. In fact, there are many, but the number of solutions which are of actual physical interest, you can divide, you can derive many of them from a mathematical point of view, but those which are of mathematical interest are actually very few. Then one can use topological methods. For example, the famous theorems of Hawking and Ellis, uh, the Penrose uh, uh, work, on singularities where he used topology uh, for which essentially, for which eventually he was awarded the Nobel prize uh, in physics uh, last year for the, for the uh, work done on black holes. Then one can use numerical methods and these are becoming increasingly popular with uh, good software. Uh, then perturbation methods uh, where you perturb something slightly and then see what happens to the system. And then the one that we're looking at, which is qualitative. And again, even here, there are many different types of approaches that one can use, like piecewise approximation, Hamiltonian approach, and qualitative, like the one that we are doing, phase plane analysis. Now in cosmology, what we do is we study the universe as a whole. And to study the universe, what one has to do is look at it on a large scale. So looking at it on a large scale, like on the scale of stars or clusters of stars, uh, we see that the universe appears to be homogeneous and isotropic. That is, if you take a large enough volume anywhere in space, the general properties within that volume appear to be same wherever you take that volume. And secondly, by isotropic, we mean that if you look in any direction, the general properties, the number of stars, the properties of stars, et cetera, the information you receive all turn out to be roughly the same. And this is also uh, strongly supported by cosmic microwave background radiation, a radiation that's coming to us from very early on in the universe, which appears to be isotropic to a very high degree. Now, for that situation, for a homogeneous and isotropic universe, the metric 
To study that is what is called the Friedman Lemaitre Robertson Walker metric, named after the people who derived this metric. And here is a metric here in this equation 26. Here T is your time and uh, R theta phi are just spherical coordinates. A is what is called your scale factor, or you can also think of it as the radius of the universe. Essentially, it tells you about the distance between any two stars, how are they changing with time. And then K here is a parameter that can be zero, plus one, or minus one. And this corresponds to what your space is like. If your space is flat, then K is zero. <clears throat> If k is plus one, then your space is closed. And finally, if your k is minus one, then your space is open. So these are curved spaces. Right, uh, now, something else that we looked at here in your, in your field equations on the right-hand side is what is called the energy momentum tensor relating to your matter in the universe. And for that, Usually, in most cases, people look at what is called a perfect fluid. By perfect, we mean that we neglect uh, heat conduction and viscosity. Of course, in certain situations, you also have to take that into account. But for, for now, let's just look at a perfect fluid. And in the case of a perfect fluid, the energy momentum tensor can be written as rho plus P U A U B plus P G A B. Now again, don't worry too much about the details. <clears throat> Just to note is that rho is your energy density and pre is your pressure of the fluid. Right, now Ua is a four velocity of the fluid. Now, in many cases, one has to assume some sort of relation between the pressure and density of the fluid. And in most cases, one assumes this type of equation of state, that is uh, P is gamma minus one times rho, where gamma is a constant. So essentially P is um, a, a constant times gamma. Now, uh, one can also consider this to be variable, but we won't look at that now. At present, at the present time, there is negligible pressure in the universe. Stars very rarely collide with each other. So you can take uh, your pressure to be zero for the current matter content. We call that dust uh, or pressure-free matter. And for that, the equation of state, this is called the equation of state, this equation here, 28, uh, P is zero. The other important const, uh, constituent of matter is what is called radiation, which is important early on in the universe, during the early stages of the universe. That was the dominant constituent of matter. And in that case, gamma is four over three, which means that the equation of state is rho, P is equal to rho over three. Right, uh, now let's just look at some cases. Uh, if you look at Einstein's equations, now you've got your cosmological constant there, lambda. Uh, first, the first thing we will do is we will look at the case when lambda is zero. Right, when lambda is zero, then from your equations, from this equation, this equation, and this equation here, you can derive uh, a set of equations which tell you how your fluid is evolving. This equation here is called a Friedman type equation. And this equation here is called a Ray Chaudhuri type equation, named after the famous Indian mathematician, Amar Kumar Ray Chaudhuri who actually did some early calculations on uh, uh, some studies relating to gravitational collapse. In fact, uh, he actually set the precursor to the work which uh, Penrose then continued in order to prove his energy theorems, I mean, his singularity theorems and so forth. So he was actually a very brilliant mathematician and it's just a little pity that he didn't delve further into this and derive uh, uh, those results, but then we must also think of the conditions at that time, the situation under which he was working and so on. Right, and then from these two equations here, one can derive what is called an energy conservation equation. This equation tells you how your rho is changing, how your density is changing with time. Sorry, one more thing here is this constant, H, not a constant, it's a parameter, H, it's called the Hubble parameter, 
And essentially, it's a derivative of the scale factor or radius a dot over a. Right, so you can write these. You have three equations, but essentially only two of them are independent. Right, and as I mentioned previously, when you want to study a system, sometimes you have to make use of a transformation. And in this case here as well, we have to introduce a new uh, time variable, tau, which is the lin of A. Right, and another is the density parameter, uh, omega, which is defined by the density divided by three x squared. Now, the reason for this is it generates uh, a dimensionless quantity, omega. And uh, we were using certain uh, special units in, in, in this uh, uh, in, in relativity so that it makes things simple. In other words, we've taken the velocity of light to be one and so forth. So that is how we can write these equations so simply. So the reason for using this is just to generate a sort of dimensionless parameter and also it enables you to uh, write the equations down more simply. And you can do this for any type of matter. Uh, in this case, we're looking at, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, ordinary matter, if you like, rho 3 and squared. But you can also define a similar quantity, which we'll do later on when it comes to looking at the cosmological constant. Then another important quantity in cosmology is what is the deceleration parameter, which essentially is a second derivative of A, the scale factor. And there's just some other things put in there to make it dimensionless. Now, one can also write this completely in terms of H because your H is A dot over A. So you can also get an expression for this completely in terms of H as well. Right, so using this now, we can write the evolution of H in terms of uh, these normalized variables. And you find that your h prime turns out to be minus one plus q h. And from the previous equations, one can also get an equation for the deceleration parameter in terms of the, uh, the uh, this density parameter omega uh, as this equation here. And then finally, using our previous equations, we can end up with an evolution equation for this density parameter omega in this form here, right? The omega d tau is minus three gamma minus two into one minus omega times omega. And one can see that this is a, essentially a one dimensional equation now. So using our previous methods, we can analyze it, find the equilibrium points, by taking the omega tau to be zero, and we see that we end up with uh, one is one, and then the other point is zero, right? So these are our two critical or fixed points, right? Our phase space is a non-negative omega axis. The reason why it's non-negative is because we expect the density to be positive always, and also we're deri dividing by h squared, so that makes it positive. Uh, the equilibrium point omega equal to zero corresponds to a certain type of solution uh, called the Mill universe. Uh, now, the thing about closed models is that those models, they expand to a maximum and then contract again. And uh, where the maximum point, at the maximum point, it turns out that this omega diverges and then the system recollapses, the universe re uh, starts contracting again. So from this point of view, uh, you've got an infinity there, so you, it's, it's a little bit incomplete analysis, but you can actually get a complete analysis by compactifying the space. And here one makes use of a technique that was originally derived and studied by Penrose, Roger Penrose, called Penrose diagrams. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to go into this. This is also another very interesting area of study. Uh, but we just note that the point omega equal to one is the flat uh, Friedman and Major Robertson Walker model. Note that in this analysis, we didn't restrict K. So you were looking at different K, different uh, curvature types of models. And here's it all illustrated here in this phase portrait. Here's your omega axis. 
here's your omega equals zero, omega equals one, the fixed points. Sorry, this one here should have been with an opal circle because this is unstable. The solutions are moving away from it. Um, this is k equal to zero. Uh, k equals to minus one on this side and k equals plus one on this side. So you see, you can get a lot of information here about the evolution of all these models. The k equal to minus one models all will tend to this solution here. The ones with k equals plus one will go in this direction here, right? So this is the analysis for the lambda equal to zero, right? And one can also uh, use another uh, software, which is called D-field to draw these one dimensional diagrams, uh, which also illustrate your solution. So here's it drawn here in this diagram. Uh, there's the uh, X on this uh, axis, or in our case, it will be the omega and the uh, time on this axis here. So you see your solutions uh, can start off anywhere. And what we saw is that they either tend to uh, uh, zero, right? Or they will uh, diverge, right? So uh, you can think of this diagram here as obtained from this diagram if you take a, a vertical section. If you take a vertical section, then you will generate this diagram. Yeah, you see they're moving away from omega equals one. Yeah, they're all moving away and they're moving towards it on this side, towards that point on this side. And on this point, they just carry on evolving, right? And as I said, you can compactify, compactify this to get a finite diagram by means of a certain transformation again. Uh, but we don't have time to look at that now. Right, then the next thing is, okay, it's also possible to look at an H omega diagram and you get these curves, uh, again, drawn in this uh, uh, P-plane software. Now let's go on to the next case, which is the, now in this case, your lambda is not zero, but K is zero and there is no radiation, right? So you've got, Pressure-free matter, but no radiation. So pressure-free matter gamma is one. Your equations can be written in this form here, your Friedman and Demetra equations. This is your energy conservation equation. Then uh, you can uh, now introduce uh, your omega corresponding to your uh, lambda term. So you define this just as we defined it for the matter term by rho divided by 3n squared. Here you divide lambda by 3n squared. Again, it gives you something that's dimensional, dimensionless. And the interesting thing about this is that if you do this, then it tells you essentially that your matter content must add up to one. In other words, omega m plus omega lambda, because here you only got matter and then matter corresponding to the cosmological constant lambda. Now, the reason why this is so important is that today, it's apart from your pressure-free matter and your radiation, certain observations tell us that the bulk of the matter in the universe is actually unseen in a form of matter which we call dark energy. It's a very exotic form of matter because it has negative pressure. So it's an exotic fluid. So that's why this is important. So that's why we analyze this case here. Right, and then again, just as we derived the equation for omega previously, in this case, you can derive this uh, differential equation here. Uh, and as you can see, again, there's two critical points, again, zero and one. But the interesting thing now is that this omega one is a stable future attractor, right? So if you look at your trajectories here, uh, what happens here is there's your zero and there's your one, right? Your trajectories would start off from zero and go in this direction here, all eventually end up here, right? And that solu the solution corresponding to that, corresponding with that point, corresponds to what is called a visitor solution, an exponential type solution, which is necessary if one wants to try to explain the dark energy that we observe in the universe today. And going back uh, in the past, the solutions, uh, 
uh, okay it's uh, uh, this this uh, uh, point here solutions uh, it actually starts off from here right so uh, you've got your solutions this is the important part where your solutions start off from here uh, they go through this matter dominated era and then end up here which corresponds to the current exponential expansion to explain dark energy Right, and then finally, one can analyze the same model, but include radiation, because radiation is important during the early stages of the evolution of the universe to explain certain things like nucleosynthesis, how the elements are synthesized or formed, etc. So we're considering both matter for which the pressure is zero and radiation for which the pressure is a third times the energy density. Now, in this case, the Friedman and Rach other type equations turn out to be these two equations here. And I think from this equation here, you can see why we define the omega. If you divide this equation by 3h squared, you see that the sum of all your forms of matter, your pressure-free matter, your radiation, and your matter corresponding to the cosmological constant turn out to be equal to 1. Right. And again, you have to introduce these same normalized variables. As I mentioned, omega m is that, omega r is your radiation divided by 3h squared, and omega lambda is your lambda divided by 3h squared. Right, uh, so uh, we call that x, we call that y, and we call that z. So we end up with this nice equation here, one is x plus y plus z. So although it looks like we've got three variables, but this is just a constrained equation. So you can re-express your z in terms of x and y. So essentially you've only got two variables. Right, and this, we may also uh, uh, can look at the energy conservation equations for each of those forms of matter, that is your matter and your radiation. Right, so, Looking at all your equations, going back to your Friedman and Rich and reusing it in this, uh, using your transformation, you end up eventually with these two equations here, uh, these two autonomous equations, x prime and y prime. Remember, it's now in terms of our new variable tau. And these, if you put that equal to zero, you end up with three critical points now, zero, one, one, zero, and zero, zero. And again, you can use your um, uh, a knowledge of the characteristic equation to determine whether it's a node or whatever. This point turns out to be an unstable repelling node. This one turns out to be a transient saddle point. In other words, you go into the, almost into the saddle point and out again, and not exactly into, because once you get into it, you can't come out again, but it's almost going infinitesimally close if you want to put it that way. And finally, the final point is zero, zero, which is a stable attracting Right, so note that this first point is unstable, this one is transient. You can essentially pass through it and this one is stable. So let's look at this diagram now, which again, we've generated with this T plane. Um, here's your Y on this axis, your X on this axis. Here's a point zero, zero. Here's a point one, zero, and here's a point, sorry. Uh, this is zero, one, and this is a point one, zero. So if you look at a typical trajectory here, it starts off from this point here, right? Which is essentially your radiation dominated era. Then it goes along here. Look at these curves, which come almost to the saddle point here and then go back to the, to the origin. It goes through a transient uh, 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 saddle point, And this could represent your uh, matter dominated era. And again, you need that era for things like structure formation and so forth. And then finally, you end up at the, at the uh, uh, stable fixed point here, which corresponds to uh, your attracting node. And this corresponds to your late time deceleration, uh, sorry, your late time acceleration, accelerating model, and this certain type, an exponential type solution. Right. So, uh, this has the, the sort of desired properties that we are looking for. You must have a radiation dominated error, you must have a matter dominated error, and you must have a late time acceleration to explain all the observations. So in conclusion, we can obtain a lot of qualitative information about the evolution of cosmological models 
rather than making assumptions. Now, obviously, one has to look at also the initial conditions and the subsequent observation, the, the subsequent evolution, which should be compatible with current observations. Now, as we mentioned, we've been able to incorporate a radiation dominated, a matter dominated, and a late time acceleration phase. But what about initial inflation? Now, in order to solve certain problems, uh, there is an initial period of inflation, a very rapid period of expansion, predicted very early on in the universe of the order of a fraction of a second. Uh, our picture here doesn't include that, but it is actually possible to uh, get that feature if one includes viscosity. And this is something also we have studied. Uh, because of lack of time, I won't go through that. But if you include viscosity, then you add an additional critical point corresponding to initial inflation. Then you have two saddles or transient critical points. And finally, you end up in a uh, node which corresponds to the current acceleration. And also, depending on your parameters that you are using to analyze these models with viscosity, Certain models also tell you that you can get an error which is beyond the current accelerated phase. In other words, you can get some information, but it's very difficult to actually say what is exactly going to happen in future. Is the current accelerated expansion going to continue forever? Will it stop at some stage? Will there be a singularity in future and so forth? All of these are current open questions for which we are still trying to get answers. So here are some nice references. Uh, for somebody who wants to get into this area, there's two very good references here by Strogatz and De Konink, uh, 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 which uh, uh, are very useful if one wants to learn about uh, dynamical systems in general. So thank you very much. And just to tell you, here's a map of South Africa. There is Durban here from where uh, I am. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. It's a very knowledgeable lecture, new for every one of us, most of us. And now we will have question answer session. So I request Dr. Virendra to take up the questions from the platform, YouTube platform. Thank you, Dr. Deepakshi. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Visham for a very informative talk. And uh, if I, I see the chat box of a YouTube channel, so I'm seeing the so many uh, uh, appreciation and uh, they are all telling that a very informative session on uh, in fact in very simple language uh, sir has described uh, dynamical system and all even when we are starting with a simple differential equation x dot equals to sine x and sir has explained it very nicely in very simple word in fact that was the most uh, uh, essential thing and a very nice uh, representation make made it uh, very valuable to all of us. Sir, we have uh, two questions. Uh, maybe they are yes. very much related. Uh, first is that uh, when <laughs> a linear system and the virginal non-linear system we have in the same way. Sorry, can you just repeat the question? Yeah, one participant is asking that when linear system and the corresponding non-linear system or that is virginal system, we have in the same way. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, no, not exactly uh, entirely. Uh, uh, what, what we do is, okay, we know what a linear system looks like, how it behaves. So when we want to look at a nonlinear system, what we do is we determine the critical or fixed points, and then we try to linearize around those points. And when we linearize around those points, then we can get the behavior near those critical points, right? And usually that is something <laughs> you are dealing with a fixed point, which is not marginal. But when you're dealing with one of these marginal fixed points, like um, a, a center, for example, then you have to look at it slightly more deeply in order to get the full picture of your face plane. There are certain techniques that one can use in order to, 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 to get the full picture. For example, if you're dealing like with a conservative system, then there are certain techniques which one can follow, which will give you in terms of the energy of the system, which will give you assistance in drawing the entire, the entire uh, phase portrait. 
So uh, in short, to look at the nonlinear system, you look at it near the fixed points, you linearize around those fixed points, you get the behavior around there, and then you try to complete the picture. Uh, sir, we, do we launch some solution when we are uh, uh, making a nonlinear nonlinear uh, uh, system to linear system? We are breaking in them in several several parts. So, are we going to launch some solution or what in this process? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, as I said right at the beginning, when you're doing a qualitative uh, uh, analysis. You're not interested in finding the exact solutions, right? But you are interested in the solutions at the fixed points. And usually, if you know the solutions at the fixed points, you can get a general idea of how your solution behaves without actually finding the complete uh, general solution. Because in most uh, nonlinear systems, it will be very difficult to find a complete exact solution. Even if you find one, it may be so complicated, it may involve certain special functions and so forth, bezel, bezel functions and so forth, transcendental functions, which make it difficult to analyze. So the technique of a phase plane or dynamical system analysis allows another way in which one can look at it qualitatively uh, rather than quantitatively. Uh, but you, you don't actually lose any solutions in the process. It, it, what, what happens is that you just don't find them exactly because you're not so interested in them. But if you're looking for oh, solutions, yes. you would look for the solutions at the fixed points themselves, and those are usually easy to find. So what are the softwares uh, which can be used to solve these systems? Okay, uh, essentially one can use, uh, there's a lot of software specifically designed for dynamical systems. Um, like I just mentioned these, which are free. Uh, P-Plane is very good if you're just starting off. but uh, you can also, with a little bit of effort, use Mathematica. Uh, you know, you have to uh, uh, sort of tweak it a little bit as it were, because it doesn't directly have a package for, for, for analyzing where you just put in the differential equation. You know, you got to do a little bit. It's not very difficult. Um, in fact, that's what we used when um, a postdoc and I uh, analyzed uh, cosmological models with viscosity. Uh, and, and it wasn't that difficult using, using uh, uh, Mathematica. Then you can also use Maple. And, and if, if you just do a search uh, uh, on the internet, you will find many such programs. Of course, not all of them are free. For some of them, there's payment involved. I mean, even Mathematica, for example, is not free. But uh, P-Plane is free. Yes, sir. Okay, sir, uh, thank you so much, sir. So uh, uh, there are so many, uh, every, every participant is saying that talk was very nice and very informative. And uh, really we are glad to uh, have you here, sir. So Dr. Deepakshi, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you so uh, much. Unmute. It was really interesting, intruding. And we'll see you soon at 3.30 at the valedictory session, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, see you very soon. Thank you, sir. Bye for now. Thank you, sir.